panel discussion on gender equality, improving gender equality in the sciences. Um, and then I will hand over to uh, Professor uh, Marie-Francoise Roy, who will um, give you some context and then we'll launch straight into some questions um, to each of the panelists. So to start, um, Professor Marie-Francoise Roy is an emeritus professor in mathematics in Rennes, in France. Uh, she was awarded the Prix Irene Joaillot Curé in 2004 and became Chevalier de la Légion d'honneur in 2009, and Officer de l'Ordre National du Mérité in 2014. She is the first president of Femme et Mathematique from uh, 80, 1987 to 1989, and she has been the convener of the European Women in Mathematics uh, organization from 2009 to 2013. She was the first chair of the International Mathematical Union Committee for Women in Mathematics, from 2015 to December 2022, and was one of the two leaders of the Gender Gap in Science project funded by the ISC from 2017 to 2019. She's also the representative of IMU, um, the International Mathematical Union, um, at the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Sciences, uh, as well as their communications officer. Um, Professor Yvonne bonzi Kulibali um, is professor at Joseph Kizerbo University in Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. For over 30 years, she has been involved in teaching organic or environmental chemistry, developing research activities and managing projects, all converging on local biomass chemistry and applications applied by women farmers for bot botanical pesticide production in a microbio refinery. Professor Bonzi Kulibale um, has been director of the Center for Environmental Studies, Research and general director of the Institute of Sciences. She's involved in scientific communities at both local and international levels and has established conferences and workshops on research themes for the benefit of scientists. She was laureate of the African Union's Kwame Nkrumah Prize for Women Scientists in Basic Research, Technology and Innovation in 2013, and is a founding member of the National Academy of Sciences, Arts and Letters of Burkina Faso. Melania, Melania Coletta uh, is formerly an accountant and then human resources professional Melania spent several, several years prior to her current role at CERN at the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. She's also worked in the private sector on projects um, accessing Euro e European Union funds for women, vulnerable populations, and other needs within specific industries. Coming into the diversity and inclusion portfolio at the European Central Bank turned into a job turned a job into sign assignment into a passion for her. Inspired by the possibilities and motivated by positive change, she's chosen to remain within the diversity and inclusion environment ever since. Her favorite motto is diversity is fact, inclusion is an act. And she has since joined CERN in April, 2022. Her philosophy is to drive and implement as many acts of inclusion as possible within the workplace. Dr. Fan Yu Zhen, the last of our panelists, uh, holds a bachelor's de degree in psychology and a master's degree in biomedical sciences from the Univers Université de Montréal, as well as a PhD in psychology from Stanford University. After her graduate studies, she joined Concordia University's psychology department as a lecturer, a position that she held three years before moving on to work as a research associate in neuroscience at the Université Laval. In 2016, she joined the Fonds de Recherche du Québec, the main research granting agency in the province of Quebec, as part of the strategic planning team. In that role, she served on the organizing committee for the Gender Summit 11 in North America, which was held in Montreal in 2017, and on the steering committee for UNESCO's STEM and Gender Advancement Project in Quebec. In 2019, she became the FRQ's first strategic advisor on equity, diversity, and inclusion. So those are our amazing panelists for this afternoon, and I will now hand, so hand over to Professor Roy um, to give you a little bit of information about um, uh, some context on uh, the International Year's actions on gender equality in sciences. It should be better. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, thanks for the invitation. So I've just prepared very few slides to present the context. Yes. So as was mentioned, uh, we have this uh, very big uh, international and interdisciplinary project called the uh, Gender Gap in Science, 
which took place from uh, 2017 to 2019. And it was involving uh, 11 scientific organizations, uh, basically international uh, unions in various sciences, such as like physics, uh, chemistry, mathematics, uh, and so on, and astronomy. And uh, it was a project supported by the International Science Council. And you can uh, find uh, the website of the, of the project here. Okay, so next. Next. So, in fact, what now? Sure. <laughs> So at the end of the project, uh, we, sorry, the one before. Yes, no, yes. So at the, at the end of the project, uh, we, we were able to produce a book, which is called the Gender Gap in Science Book, and it's reporting on the three aspects of the project that we worked on. One was a questionnaire, the survey, global survey of scientists, where we got more than 30,000 answers all over the world. And uh, the other was some uh, data analysis of communication patterns uh, having to do with the proportion of uh, women uh, publishing uh, in various aspects of science. And the third one was a study of the best practices that people had uh, suggested to, uh, to improve the gender gap in science. Okay, next. So this book, in fact, is... is um... Marie-Francoise, sorry to jump in, but I think your microphone is having a little bit of distortion. Yeah. Um, could you potentially um, try coming off the headphones? Maybe that will help. Is this better? Uh, yes, I think that is better. That's okay. Better okay, thank you. Sorry. Sorry for that. Okay, so um, so the, the, this way is good, right? Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, so I wanted to mention that after the after the book was finished, we also created what we call the Gender Gap in Science Booklet, which is a summary of the project in eight pages in several languages, and uh, uh, they include four pages of recommendations that we think are good uh, initiatives to reduce the gender gap. And finally, I wanted to say, so next, that we created also some uh, permanent structure at the end of the project. It's what is called the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science, which is part of the International Year for Basic Sciences and uh, sustainable development. And uh, this committee is organizing a webinar, which is widely followed, and also uh, organizing an annual report of all its members. So there are more than 20 members now, which are the international uh, scientific unions. And they work together in order to see what are the best initiatives and the best practices that they can share in order to reduce the gender gap. So what I wanted to say that uh, in spite of many efforts, the gender gap in science is very real and women are underrepresented and discriminated in several ways all over the world in all possible scientific disciplines. Maybe in some disciplines there are very few women uh, even in, inside the population who study the science. But in other sciences, the women are main, very many as well to start with. But at the end, when you look at the top levels, um, say like uh, full professorship or uh, international, uh, uh, for example, uh, being leaders of international unions and this kind of thing, you see that the proportion of women becomes very, very small. So I think it's a very, as many people mentioned already, I mean, I was attending the last session and many people mentioned the importance of diversity for basic sciences and also of uh, reducing the gender gap. So it's really a problem which is very universal and very important for scientists. 
So I think what's important is to work at an international level and to work also at the interdisciplinary level. So every initiative in this spirit, I think, is uh, quite useful and it will take a long time to be able to reduce entirely the gender gap in science, I guess. So that's just what the few words I wanted to, to say to give the context. So there are some links, like the book I mentioned, the, the link was not visible, I guess, but it's on Zenodo. So Zenodo, which was developed by CERN, by CERN as we've been learning uh, earlier in the afternoon. And uh, so it's freely available. All of what we are doing is uh, freely available on the various uh, websites. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will now start the more panel part of the discussion. Um, I will actually take us back to people be reminded of who is speaking to you. Um, and I'm going to start by asking each of you in turn to give um, a short introduction on what policies they know of in place at the moment uh, to address um, gender equality, uh, specifically either at their institutions or more generally in the general public. So we'll start with um, Yvonne Bonzi Kulivali. Um, okay. Maybe should I shot Hello, sharing then? everybody, and thank you. So I can take my time from my talk. It is that. Okay. So in Burkina Faso, where I am, in West Africa, uh, gender inequality is uh, the same like in other countries in developing uh, countries. There are common uh, reasons, well-known reasons, and uh, due to social and uh, cultural obstacles, many girls are fully excluded from education because they are more affected by some household work, some family due to some early marriage, some pregnancy, some childcare. So it's difficult for them to, to reach high level education. In my country, one girl on 10 married before her 15th birthday. So the government have uh, some uh, incitative uh, policies I can uh, sit few of them, which are very important. Since 2017, girls' quota exists in uh, for admission in high school. And uh, also these high schools are like uh, excellence centers for uh, science education in secondary school. Also for new bachelor, there is a quota about 300 scholarship for girls to be at the university. And also for the doctoral scholarship, we have some uh, facilities about the, the, the age. When the limit of age is 22 for men, it is 24 for girls. This is very good. And also the, the average, for uh, the most half, uh, one uh, eleven dot fifth for uh, girls toward twelve for boys. So, despite all these uh, facilities, the situation are always very difficult. In my university, we have uh, about uh, 40, 14 percent of the uh, female teaching in our university. So me, I think that this charity is due to the fact that the action most reach the secondary level. It is at the secondary level that we have to make a high sensibilization of uh, people to help girls to reach high level of education and to choose also science for the, the, the education. There are many activities, but I just want to highlight the importance of a panel 
I am actually in a panel. I think this uh, event is very important because it's easy to organize. And I believe in the world of a woman, we have to choose local women who have in the same context succeeded to their career, succeeded their studies, and also have a family. So this example is, uh, I believe in the, the work of this kind of ladies who succeed despite all the difficulties in a local uh, uh, situation. So the academy organized by moment some uh, panel with uh, physicians, uh, chemists, uh, biologists, so on. And I think it is very important to show pictures of uh, this model, this woman self, and uh, because their work can speak to the parents, to the students, and to all the communities. This is my first word for the moment. That's very powerful, I think, to say to believe in the word of woman is a really, really great um, thing to hear. Um, I will then pass on to Melania Coletta to continue. Thank you, Anita. Okay, so um, I'm bringing today to the table um, a different perspective, which is the one coming from, from CERN. CERN is not an institution, although we work in science. We work in science, but we are not academia, although we feel a bit like academia. Um, currently at CERN, we have different uh, policies in place to address issues surrounding gender inequality. Um, uh, we start from the very beginning. We really believe that um, it starts at school. It starts maybe in primary school. Uh, there is a research saying that uh, girls go away from science between eight and 10 years old. So at CERN, for example, there is a, an outreach program that goes to teachers in schools and, um, and enhance their, um, their way of uh, teaching science. Uh, later on, we are, for example, allowing now some of the departments at CERN, they allow their people when they fly back home to go to their schools of origin, to go to talk to the, to the students of those schools and to promote a career in science. Uh, with, of course, there is a focus on girls in science. We have different programs at CERN, like for students, for grads, for PhDs, et cetera. So we try to, to accompany them to work to, throughout their patterns, but as well as we also have, for example, a career break fellowship, which is a returnship program for a woman, for example, that had interrupted their career for a certain amount of years for X reasons. Most common reason it's uh, mother, motherhood, and then they want to return to a career in science. So those are a bit of the programs that we are uh, we are offering, and we believe uh, in this way we are supporting the the community out there, the science community. Of course, we do high energy physics, but uh, it's not only physicists CERN. Uh, we have a lot of engineers and a lot of people in STEM. Um, last but not least, I would say that I would like to, to say that uh, um, two years ago, for the first time at CERN, we have launched our uh, 25 by 25 strategy, which is a strategy that aims, among other, other things, to increase the percentage of women we hire for at CERN. Uh, we want to, to get to the 25% of women at CERN by 2025. Of course, this is an aspirational target, but it really shows a serious and clear commitment that we are having towards this. Um, and last thing that I want to say is that uh, it's very interesting how then the academia world is also now into this topic. It's, it's exploring the topic and it's growing into the topic because we really believe that um, none of us should be an island. I'm representing CERN and my and my fellow panelists, they're representing their own institution, but mainly we are representing ourselves as women working in science. And I'm probably I'm the less scientist here in the panel, but definitely it's a collaboration among all the institutions, among all the all the all the companies that work around STEM moving together in the same direction. Thank you. Um that was great to hear also from slightly I love the CERN as academic, non-academic perspective. Um, so I've passed then on to a, even less, I suppose, inside academia perspective in a way, to Fanny Eugène. Um, so please continue. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, so I work for the Fonds de Recherche du Québec, which is the primary funding agencies in Quebec province uh, in Canada. 
Um, and what's particular about us is that we fund research in all fields. So uh, STEM, of course, but also health related uh, research and social sciences, humanities, arts and literature. So, of course, there are different challenges uh, for women in uh, those different sectors. So the, the, the Quebec Fund for STEM started pretty early putting on measures for attracting uh, more women to STEM. Uh, so we have several policies uh, that have been put in place, but that have also been offered in the other uh, two funds to make sure that uh, we have um, the, the same consideration for all, um, all our students or researchers. So some of the policy, policies, of course, are related to parental leave. So uh, anyone who applies to our program, if there's a, a period uh, of eligibility, this one, the, the eligibility period can be extended if the person went on to um, maternity leave during this, peri uh, this period. And the same is true for um, scholarship or grant holders uh, who are allowed to uh, postpone the grant payments or scholarship payments uh, during parental leave. But for our scholarship holders, uh, we also have a paid parental leave. So for eight months, if uh, well, they're allowed to take longer for parental leave, but uh, for eight months during parental leave, they get to uh, receive uh, the same uh, funding that they would for their scholarship. And the scholarship is uh, extended at the end. So, um, and this is offered to both women and men. Um, we also want to encourage uh, uh, pr uh, paternal leaves uh, in our um, in our community. Um, we also put in place um, implicit bias training for our reviewers. I can't remember, maybe five years ago, so 2018, I think. Um, so that's something that uh, is, is being done uh, also at the federal level in Canada uh, to make sure that reviewers are aware of the kinds of <laughs> biases that can slip in during uh, a review, not only gender related, but uh, also related to the prestige of the institution uh, to uh, um, racial considerations age uh, as well. Um, and we also have this, uh, this training for our, uh, our personnel or staff as well. And another important thing um, that we, we, we consider is how the research is performed. So not only who does the research, but is the research considering sex and gender, which is also uh, extremely important. So all applicants uh, who propose a, a research project have to think about whether it's uh, relevant to consider uh, sex or gender and explain uh, if they do, how they're going to consider it, and if they don't, why they're not uh, considering it. So this is uh, not limit, like all our actions, uh, the actions I've described relate to gender equality, but since 2021, we also have a, a larger strategy on EDI, so equal, uh, equity, diversity, inclusion. So uh, uh, we've moved beyond uh, gender equality to include other uh, aspects of diversity and other aspects of gender as well. We've had data on women and men, but now we have data on uh, uh, beyond the binary, so in uh, gender diverse uh, individuals. And so our actions always have this intersectional lens to make sure that we're not uh, we don't have a specific group in our uh, 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 blind <laughs> blind spot. Lovely also to hear about, as you said, those intersectional actions. Um, that I think is a really really important topic. Um, and lastly, we come on to Marie Francoise um, to see um, if you would like to add some detail for us. Francoise, you're muted. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, so I must say uh, I really like the all the presentations because uh, they are insisting on various aspects of how to reduce the, the gender gap. So uh, 
Yvonne insisted on the importance of these uh, role models and uh, education. And uh, then uh, there was also uh, these examples from what is done in, in FERM and in Quebec. And I think that's what we need, I think. We need to really exchange uh, these good practices. And it's something we, we want to do in a more systematic way after the Gender Gap in Science project and inside this uh, Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science to have really a forum of discussion of what people do and what is working better and uh, what, what is improving the, the situation. So, for example, uh, one thing we found very useful in mathematics, because I was uh, the chair of this committee for women in mathematics, as was mentioned, is to have an international network of kind of, we, we call them CWM ambassadors. So. CWM was a committee for women in mathematics, and we've been inviting people to be representatives in their own country in order to collect the data and also to uh, to, to create uh, their own uh, network and to distribute information. And we think this is also uh, giving really a very good ground for making uh, making changes to to have this. Um, exchanges between people in various uh, contexts, in, uh, in various countries, in various continents, and being able to have them uh, really do a network and, and work together. So I think that's uh, one aspect which uh, I consider as, uh, as very important, and uh, I would like really to encourage also people to, to work this way in other, in other disciplines. But um, Okay, so I think that's what I wanted to, to say. Maybe I, I would add one thing we really discovered when we were studying this, uh, when we were looking at this gender gap uh, in science uh, project, uh, the results from the global survey, is that when you look at the gender gap, maybe sometimes you discover some other problems. Like, for example, when we were comparing Africa and the rest of the world, we notice that sometimes the difference between men and women in Africa is less important than the difference between Africa and the rest of the world in terms of being, uh, say, having uh, problems with uh, access to funding or access to resources and so on. So sometimes when you look at the gender gap, you also discover some more uh, other social uh, problems, and I also believe that in terms of diversity, I mean, I know this, for example, at the International Mathematical Union, we have this uh, committee for women in mathematics, but there is also now a new committee called Committee on Diversity, and we see that the techniques we are using to do this network of women can be very useful also for having other, other networks, uh, for other communities, and uh, for other forms of uh, discrimination. So. I think it's really uh, very useful to have all these uh, various approaches. That's what I wanted to, to say. Thank you. Um, so to kind of pick up then and carry on a little bit, um, I know we, we've talked a lot about policies um, and it's actually really interesting to hear which different policies uh, arise out of that a lot. Um, and I wanted to ask what you believe are the advantages um, of having more gender equality in the scientific community and in scientific research. Um, so I'll start with Yvonne again, if that's okay. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, effort was done, but uh, something is missing uh, to, to reach the, the gap of the parity between women and men. What I will suggest is that uh, we have to go uh, to the secondary level to do something. And I, I think that the panel, I said, we can, in each scientific uh, event, we can organize in parallel with the participant, female participant, we can organize panel to show these ladies to, uh, to people. And, uh, I think that girls are deemed to have no ambition, curiosity, and no capacity for long-term studies. This is due to communication. Because during years, I observed different contexts with women, either students or farmers. I noticed that the apparent lack 
of ambition is due to the lack of communication. So we have to strengthen the capacity of uh, student, of scholar in communication. If they are good communicators, they can have a voice, they can be curious because they will ask questions. And if they ask questions, they help them to go more and more in uh, higher level of service. So we kind of be improved in our uh, institution. And uh, because uh, Armatia San, Nobel Prize in Economy said, when women are educated, they gain a voice and they take a place in the society, which gives them more economic opportunity. So we have health in the, the, the world. You have also, you are not, women are not always eternal beneficiary. They have to participate also to produce uh, knowledge, to uh, make conception in uh, problems and so to have the solution for themselves. Not only men to build uh, knowledge for women who are always beneficiary. So it's better to help this uh, civil student who are in the university with good capacity in communication. And I think that they will have the build their lives themselves. Thank you. Um, I will then ask Melania for the same question of what you think gender equality can bring to the community as a whole, the scientific community as well. Thank you. I think that uh, maybe I would propose everybody to do one step back and not look only at the scientific community, but look at from an organizational perspective. Um, Burke and Dillon in 2018, they, they issued a report called the Diversity and Inclusion Revolution. Um, it's a study, so it's a paper, it's uh, science-based, it, although it's not um, physics, but I think it's social science. And uh, they have analyzed um, the context in which they were working and the outcome was very impressive in my opinion. Like organizations with an inclusive culture are three times as likely to be high performing, six times more likely to be innovative and agile, and eight times more likely to achieve a, bit, a better business outcome. Now. Let's take this and let's bring it into the scientific community. And I just have a question for all of us here. In the community, in the scientific community, where the general aim is to advance humanity, isn't all of this even more relevant? And I will conclude here. Thank you. Think about there, I think. It's always useful to, as you say, is take a step back. Um, so I'll pass that on to Fan Yuzhen. Yes, I fully agree with what uh, my colleagues uh, said previously, and um, I, I'm, I'm going to hit the nail on the head a little bit about uh, what is being researched, because um, <clears throat> there are uh, there are limitations to research on women, research on women's issues. Uh, we've known for a long time that uh, a lot of uh, studies, especially in health, have been done on men and uh, assuming that they were the standard and uh, without considering uh, sex or gender. Uh, there are kind of famous stories of uh, medications that had to be uh, taken out uh, off market because there were uh, 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 secondary effects uh, on, on women because they hadn't been tested on women. And um, uh, a study by uh, by Sana Rivière showed that um, women are more likely to uh, tackle uh, diver uh, to take into consideration sex and gender in their research. And an even more recent study showed that um, that showed the effect of uh, gender and racial equalities in the scientific workforce on the advancement of science uh, and. It shows that there are topics that are not covered that should be uh, because of the lack of diversity uh, in the, the scientific uh, workforce. So there is a, a relationship between diversity in the workforce and expansion of uh, the knowledge base. So a lot of topics would receive more attention uh, if there was more gender equality in uh, um, 
in the scientific workforce, but not only gender, but also uh, just general uh, equality in, uh, in this. So it does affect what is being uh, paid attention to in research. So what we know about the world. I think you're so right. Um, yeah, there's, I think medical, the health is a really good example of where we have real inequality because of a lack of women. But I think another that is pertinent that I will bring up is artificial intelligence and diversity in um, the development of AI, which is, I think, a really interesting field. Um, but I won't talk over anymore. And I will instead pass on to Mary Francoise, who I think probably has something more interesting to say. Yeah, so uh, I think one other topic, one other scientific topic, which I think very interesting is archaeology, uh, for which uh, there were a lot of bias in consideration of, uh, of archaeological research. And uh, when uh, someone was found with a, with a sword, it was in initially uh, thought it's necessarily a man, but now with all the DNA analysis, uh, we can find uh, that uh, sometimes uh, in fact they, they were women warriors. So just just to, to say, I think this is very important for scientists to, to be aware that, of course, it's maybe not so much the case inside mathematics, where we don't see uh, directly a bias related to, to gender, but in many sciences, and um, several were mentioned, like uh, health, uh, artificial intelligence, and archaeology, it plays really a very important role and in many of them also. So uh, I just wanted to to encourage uh, everybody to do what was done during this uh, special day of the international year, which is to involve at, inside the scientific activities as a, as a side activity and something which is important to include in fact, the discussions on, on gender and diversity inside the scientific events. And I think also what uh, Yvonne was suggesting, that uh, it's also scientists should also reach the uh, younger people, in, uh, secondary school uh, people, and, uh, and uh, try to, to really tell them what science is about. So I think all these, all these aspects are very uh, important in order to to promote uh, gender equality. But I think also we should not get discouraged because if you look, for example, at the proportion we, we've been looking in, in our project to the uh, percentage of women authoring uh, mathematical papers in the last 50 years, and we discovered that the number is really growing. I mean, it was like from 10% to 27%. So things are changing. I think they are changing very slowly. I think that uh, there is from time to time an evaluation on given the rate of progress, how long it will take us to reach uh, gender equality. And I think the current estimation is about when 150 years based on, <laughs> on the recent projects for us. So it's not going to happen immediately. It will take time. It will take really a lot of changes in everybody's mind because women are not always supporting supportive of women so it's also something that needs to be to be said and uh, and it's kind of also dialectic between what's going on in society in general and what is going on in science but since education is so important i think that the topic of gender equality in science has really a very big influence on uh, on society so maybe I'll take one example, which is uh, the case of Maria Mirbakani. So she was a mathematician from Iran, and then she went to study to the US, and she was the first woman to receive the Field Medal. And her influence and impact in her own country is, I believe, really very important in the history of women in Iran. And we see that this uh, history, unfortunately, is not yet uh, is, the problems are not yet solved, but Iran, for example, is a country where there are many, many women in science. And I think it's, it's this uh, high proportion of uh, women in science is really something meaningful also for all women, more globally. So, yeah. 
So we are not just a little part of the population. We are, we are really, uh, I would say, a sector where gender equality is particularly relevant. You're so right, I think a really fascinating example as well. Um, I then, I have a slightly different tack. So now we've established some policies that exist and also why we generally believe that gender equality is really vital. Um, I'm gonna ask, uh, go a slightly different route and ask you each what you think, what you personally see are the main areas of challenge and concern surrounding gender equality or achieving gender equality in the region or the country where you live. So what do you see are the, the main barriers? Um, and I'll start again, we'll get, we're going alphabetically. I'll start with Yvonne again. Yes, me, I feel that I think the main barrier is the communication. Ladies in Africa don't, uh, speak a, a, a lot. So I think that uh, this is a barrier. But with the model, the women model, I think they can see, the student can see that a woman can be high level in education, be a, a scientist, a senior scientist with success stories and uh, that it's possible to do profession and to have a family and to see some happy ladies, scientists, happy ladies. I think uh, this is very important. And I say that the local women are the most uh, efficient. So I think the financial issue is a, a big point to give scholarship to students, to give grant for, uh, for um, for uh, doctoral studies and also to plan some gender approach in the selection of, uh, of uh, some places at the, the university when there is some uh, new, new, new application to be future. I think women can have there also some facilities. And uh, so on, I think that uh, the Scientists, women like me, we, it is an obligation to do something all your life, to show to younger students, to show to uh, people that they can arrive if they want. So it is a, an obligation and uh, maybe some research can uh, be done to see if uh, what is the, the impact of all the activities we are, we are planning uh, for the benefits of, uh, of students. Maybe it must be evaluated also. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was just thinking how much I also would love to see more representation of happy women in science. <laughs> Struggling, thriving, just happy. Yes. Um, uh, Melania, then I'll pass on to you next. Of course, thank you very much. Um, if I have to pick one of the many challenges that I think we all see in uh, gender equality in science out there, I would probably drill it down to the difference between equality and equity. Um, when it comes to when it comes to gender equality, I even in informal conversation, I often get this, this answer from, let's say, for a stereotypical male out there. Um, yeah, but who is telling women not to come? Who is telling women not to join? Who is telling women not to have a career in science? They can come the same way I came. They can come, and for them, this this is what we should be offering. And now I'm speaking about like the very resistant people to change that likely are very few out there. I hope I want to believe. <laughs> and uh, the answer is this: is like yes, we want to have gender equality, but in order to have gender equality, we need to apply some equity because the process that are very um, masculine oriented society has put in place do not work for the women that are now entering now I mean in the past century are entering more the job market historically speaking with the difference between the different areas this said it's uh, probably a cultural resistance and the uh, cultural trump strategy for for breakfast as they always say which means that is the very 
is the most difficult thing to change is the culture of people. It's not about like, yeah, women want to come, let them come. It's like, no, let's make a moment of self-analysis. Let's kill our biases out there, starting from the recruitment, as Ivan was mentioning before, and going on with all that is their work life and making it accessible, accessible for women. But a workplace that works for women works better for everybody else. So I think that this is really the, the biggest challenge out there, and this is to convince society, the most resistant part of society, that in order to achieve equality, gender equality in science and in other fields, we need to apply some equitable principles. Thank you. So I think a really important point for people to listen to the kind of difference of between equality and equity, um, because I think both are so, so important. Um, so Fanny Eugene. Yes, I, I'm fully behind uh, <laughs> what uh, what Melania just said about um, uh, about difference between equality and equity, um, and the fact that sometimes you need to uh, I don't know shine a big big light on <laughs> the obstacles that some people have to go through, which may not be apparent to uh, those who do not face um, those uh, those obstacles. And the academic culture, and I think that's everywhere, is a, a, a very particular uh, culture um, that doesn't really make place for uh, maternity leave or, or just parental uh, responsibilities. So I think that's changing, but it's it's uh, it's probably the the biggest issue. And in Quebec. Uh, we have a fairly uh, equal society, um, but of course we're not shielded from gender norms um, so that the, the impact of stereotypes on uh, little girls who uh, don't see themselves as future scientists or as uh, what we would call a genius um, since like starting at age five, that's, also a problem and I think that's everywhere because we're exposed to the same uh, social societal uh, norms but I think there's a lot of uh, work on that and uh, you were talking uh, Melania about resistance and I think that uh, if you've been following the news a little bit in, in our um, uh, our neighbor to the south there is some resistance <laughs> pretty intense resistance uh, to uh, equality, to feminism, to anti-racism that's brewing. And I don't think we're immune to that. I mean, we've seen some signs of this coming. So I think that's gonna be a very important thing to uh, keep in mind in our communication, this resistance that's being a little bit, uh, a little bit more vocal um, these days. Absolutely. I think actually sometimes that kind of more vocal resistance helps to defeat what Mary Francoise was talking about earlier, like, you know, that fatigue or burnout that we, I think, all sometimes probably experience. But speaking of our personal men to Mary Francoise to wrap up um, the kind of formal part of the panel discussion. Yeah. So um, I think uh, one uh, one thing which was mentioned, which is really quite important, is the fact that uh, we need really some uh, specific uh, initiatives uh, towards women. So I think what was mentioned was, for example, of course, men or men, if they take care of children, like this extension of parental leave, for example, which was mentioned, but I think it's it's also some kind of uh, much more global. I mean, like uh, if uh, there was some interruption in uh, in the work because of some uh, uh, workload related to having a child, but maybe taking care of someone in the family. I mean, some health issue and so on. We should not be. Uh, I think the kind of uh, model for scientists is as was mentioned already someone with no interruption, with no flow, who's just totally devoted to science. And this does not work for many people. It doesn't work for women in many cases, but it also doesn't work for other people. 
Bon, il so I think that to be more diverse, to accept more broken career path, to accept people who are maybe more original, more different in their way of uh, of studying and, and doing research is really something uh, also which uh, which plays a, a key role in uh, in uh, in uh, being able to to reduce the the gender gap. But uh, so, so in a way, we need some kind of universal uh, principle that make it possible for everybody to, to be part of science. But we also need to be very aware of small, something that look like small details, but are not small details, which make it possible for people to, uh, to, to proceed in their career, even though they don't fall entirely in the kind of uh, scheme of what is considered as uh, being, a, being a scientist. So it's really something we, several of us said already, I mean, the importance of culture, the importance of, uh, of model, what kind of person we, we want to, to advertise and to illustrate. And also, we don't need only very big names as examples of scientists, we need many people. And uh, if we are in Burkina Faso, of course, uh, it's important to, to have uh, women from the country which are taken as examples. And, uh, and uh, so I think all of this effort is going to, to be important, to take time, but at the end to, to produce uh, consequences. So that's fine. What I wanted to say at that point. Um, yeah, also, I think a really excellent point about feeling represented within your own country as well, um, something that we often don't think about. Um, so I have, we have a few more minutes, um, and I'd like to open up to you a quick, some quick questions from, from our audience. If not, I have one question that I can go around and ask. Um, so is, are there any questions? I, I will type any in the chat if they come up on YouTube. Oh, I, okay. Um, I don't see any in the chat, but I've also just received a message saying that we have to wrap up. So we might have to wrap up actually. Um, but I'd like to thank our panelists very much for what I think was a really fascinating discussion and also for all their time in preparing for this event and helping me out. Um, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you for organizing. <laughs> thank you yeah. very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.